everybody. I'm Olaf. Uh, I'm going to present uh, Metals, building rich IDE features beyond the language server protocol today. Um, if you're not familiar with Metals, it's a language server that gives code completions and jump to definition in ed editors like VS Code, Vim. Um, so, and if you're not familiar with the language server protocol, don't worry. I'll explain it just in, in, in just a bit. Um, uh, so this is my first time presenting here in the US. And it's also my first time presenting as a Twitter employee. So I'm super excited to be here. And I'm really excited to show you some of the amazing progress that has been made in the Metals project for the last five months. Um, and when I say <coughs> we, it's, it's actually been a, a large collaborative effort from, from a lot of people. So I'm here on stage sharing what, what's really been done by a large team uh, from different organizations. So it includes uh, Jorge, who's here in the, the room as well. Uh, Gabriele, Tomas, Marek, Chris, and uh, also 50 other contributors uh, that have been working for the last year on this project. So um, I want to talk about bridging the IDE gap. And it's, the IDE gap is, is not a thing on Wikipedia. Uh, it's, it's a thing you'll, I'll explain in a bit. So really, what, once upon a time before, you know, and it's not really a long time ago. It's maybe five years ago. If you were doing you know, language tooling, um, you, you, there was the situation where you'd build a custom, if you were you know, a compiler author of a new programming language and you wanted to have code completions working in, in IntelliJ and in Vim and in Sublime, you, you, you ended up doing a custom integration for each of these editors. And then on comes the next language and repeat. Um, and as you can imagine, there, there would be holes in this matrix of, of, of support. You know, some editors did not work with some languages, um, et cetera. And, and usually the situation was that IntelliJ just had support for everything, and that's pretty great. Um, so enter the language server protocol that came a few years ago, uh, kind of solved this problem where if you're a compiler author, uh, you'd only have to know your own compiler stuff. You didn't have to know any details about a, um, what the editor provides. Um, and then if you're you know, the author of an editor, you could just do the stuff that the editor does best, which is you know, rendering completions and, and sending save notifications and manipulating buffers. Um, and, and so the language server protocol kind of created a, a contract between these language servers and editors. And uh, what's amazing is that you'd only have to do one client for Vim once. And then it will work for you know, a list of n languages. And vice versa, if you're a language author, you can just do one language server and you, you know, support uh, multiple editors. And uh, in reality, now, Metals, I'd say this you know, theory is working great. Uh, it's in, pre in, in, in reality, you, know, you can see here that we support an incredible number of features. And it works with, you know, we officially support six editors. And considering the, how small our team is, uh, and this project is less than a year old, it's incredible that we can support these number of features in so many different editors. There are tiny holes here and there, usually by lack of, of, of support in some editor for a specific feature. But otherwise, it's pretty amazing. Um, and uh, some of the latest things that we've been adding just in the past two weeks in Metals, which uh, I've been told some people are excited about, uh, we've also added uh, rename symbol and uh, find implementation, which is where you can say, find me all of the subclasses of this class. Or you can also find all of the methods that override a specific method. So, so this has just been merged into master, but it's not in a stable release yet. Um, so. The IDE gap is that you know, we grind through, we implement all of these LSP features, we, we fill out the protocol, and, and people are excited. And then I'm like, why don't you switch to, to VS Code? And I want to maybe do a small survey in the room. How many people here use IntelliJ? And yeah, it's, I'm not surprised. I mean, it's usually 90 plus percent, especially in the Scala community. And for a good reason, I think IntelliJ is a fantastic product. It's very rich with a bunch of great editing features. Um, so even if you do the work of fully implementing LSP, uh, you're not at feature parity with an IDE such as IntelliJ or, or Xcode 
or Eclipse or Visual Studio. So what, what I'm talking about in this talk here is kind of that gap. It's like how do we reach that feature parity in, in the language server protocol world? So I hope that excites you. I'm going to say that there's four elements to this here that, that maybe not go 100%, but go a long way. So in this talk, I'm going to be presenting debug adapters, uh, tree views, worksheets, and build servers. So these are all concepts that just have no notion whatsoever in, in the language server protocols back, uh, but I think are essential for anyone trying, you know, aspiring to, to build an IDE. Um, so let's begin with debug adapters. Um, there is a debug adapter protocol that originated at Microsoft um, and has currently implementations for dozens of languages. So it's, it's I'd say, has widespread industry adoption. Uh, it's less known than LSP. Um, and it has support in multiple editors. I found out last night doing the slides that it also works in Vim. Uh, which was mind-blowing. <laughs> um, uh, but the, the best support is really in VS Code. So uh, if you do a bit of legwork doing a language server, uh, you can add buttons to say run. And uh, the button to say run is actually displayed via LSP. But what happens when you invoke that is kind of like an any to unit function. You can do whatever you like. And uh, with a bit of customization on our, in our VS Code extension uh, and a bit of customization on the Metal's server side and also on the um, build side, which I'll explain in a bit, uh, we're able to provide this experience where essentially it starts a debugger. Um, and we treat running as debugging without breakpoints. Uh, by doing that, we get a lot of the nice benefits in VS Code where you can see that the status bar becomes orange. Uh, it opens up a debug console. And on, on, on the left, you see an empty kind of watch variable call stack uh, part, which, which we'll use once, once we have support for debug, breakpoint debugging. So I think this is exciting. Running a main function is, is great. If someone doesn't know anything about programming, they can just write a main function, run it in VS Code, and they don't even have to start a build tool. They don't have to know how to run a terminal. I think that's phenomenal. It's making you know, coding accessible to just so many more people. Um, and not only that, we also have support now for, for running tests. So if you write a test suite, um, the button appears there. Currently, it's very raw, as you, as you can see. There's just a test text string. Uh, it'd be nice to add a, you know, a button above each individual test case. Uh, kind of the way it's displayed in IntelliJ, and, and that's pretty much we're on track to, to go there. This is the, the, the early, earliest feature that we could ship. And this is merged into master right now. It'll be available in the next snapshot, no, in, in the next stable release. Um, what's coming very soon is actually breakpoint debugging, where you're able to say stop here, and as you can see on the the left side, there is a variable. You can look at the E variable. Uh, you can go to it, it, you can step into methods from your library dependencies, and you can also step into Java. Um, and this is enabled thanks to the fact that we run on the JVM, and there is a Java debugger that already exists, and we're able to just plug and play. Um, and this will be coming soon. It's not merged, but I'm super excited about it because. I personally never debug. Uh, I just print line debug. Uh, but having just talked to a lot of people who code, uh, they, this is a blocking issue. Essentially, a lot of people work with debuggers. And I think it's especially, it depends on if, you're, if you work with large dependencies, there's something weird in your dependencies. You just can't sprinkle a print line in a third party library. Uh, then debugging is just a much better tool for that. And I think it's also if you have an application that's just really slow to start. Um, it's, it's useful that you can, you know, you don't have to add a print line, save, wait for compilation, takes the time it takes to start the, the method, you know, the program, and then um, figure out what's going on. So the Metal's debug adapter, which um, exists, is, was contributed by Virtus Lab. Uh, they have um, been collaborating very closely with the Scala Center, where I was working before. 
and uh, they implemented this in Bloop, which is the build server behind Metals. And I'll be talking about build servers in just a bit. But really, Metals doesn't do the debugging itself. It's just a proxy for the debugging, which happens in the build server. And I think that was a conscious design choice to say that the language server, we should not be running and evaluating code. Um, it's the build tool that knows how to execute code. Uh, it's the build tool that, as we've seen talks on Bazel, on, on that it's, it's complex machinery, how to launch. Maybe it's running on a, you know, on a remote dev box. You never know. Uh, so, so Metals just delegates. But what Metals provides is saying that we know that the main class is on this line number. And as you're editing, we can update. You know, we can understand that like the syntax tree of the program, this is a test suite. We can know that there's going to be a button over a test case. And that's really beyond the knowledge of the build tool. The build tool does not really operate at the level of a method is a test case, et cetera. So, so in, in practice, really, how this is implemented is that there's the editor speaking debug adapter protocol to Metals, which Metals will just forward onto the build server. There's a very rare case where you're navigating to third-party library dependencies. Metals knows where they are, and Metals knows how to produce those source files that we sometimes populate uh, before passing onto the build server. But Metals does a really small job in this kind of picture. So I'm super excited about debug adapters. But I'm personally, for myself, uh, even more excited about, uh, well, three views, but also the next one after that. But I'll start with three views. <coughs> So three views are maybe less exciting uh, at a conference presentation, but I think they're very important to giving that good use X. Is um, we added a tree view protocol in Metal, so it's really just not an industry standard whatsoever. Uh, there is a server implementation, you know, for Scala, and but I'm very excited to say that there is a client implementation for Emacs that you know we did not implement. Uh, so that's a goal, an, an accomplishment. Um, and what they really are is just file explorers, as you're used to. You can expand the directory. You can list the children's. You can expand other parts of that thing. Uh, and it sounds super boring. Like, it's a file explorer. What's, what's the deal? But it's a huge deal, because uh, Metals has, it's just sitting on a wealth of knowledge about your code base, about your library dependencies. And we can give you a tree view here, for example, that allows you to navigate your third-party library dependencies. And as you can see, we list you know, methods inside of a class. This is not the file structure on disk. This is the structure of your code base. Um, and what's really cool with the button that we pressed there at the top there is that uh, we're able to synchronize the cursor position down to that method that you have in your, your library dependencies. Uh, which, and then you can click on a class, and it will move the cursor to that position. Uh, and this is a feature that just is not an LSP at all. You take it for granted in IntelliJ, and it's very helpful if you're just trying to kind of, oh, what does this package contain? Um, and um, so we released this in, in July, and I've heard just a lot of positive feedback. So another cool thing you can do with um, tree views is this, this part here where you have a large multi-module build. You're compiling 10 different projects in parallel. Um, and it's kind of difficult in an editor where you just have text uh, to, to display that information, which is so rich that you have progress on three different modules. One of them is at 10%. The other one has been running for two minutes. Um, and here we do this with the tree view where we can tick on every second and say, these are the things that we're currently compiling, and that's the progress we've made on, on, on these projects. Um, I think this is very cool. And essentially, Metals is not a build tool. It's, it's a language server. So the actual information that we're displaying here is streamed from our build server, uh, which is Bloop in this case, which I'll explain in just a bit. Um, so um, that's very cool, and I think this is probably the least impressive, but I think, if anything, it's not the least impactful feature that we can do with tree views, is that how do you get help if a person, you know, a user who just started programming is trying to figure out, like, where do I ask a question? 
there's nothing in LSP that allows the server to, to, to tell the user, like, hey, you can report a bug here. You can actually open up a chat room there. Um, you know, read our docs. You can go to that website. Um, and uh, follow us on Twitter. Um, and, and this was it's such a st small, stupid thing, like links to, to, to websites. But if you do a basic language server and you just follow the protocol, there's no way for you to display that information to the user. Um, and I think, yeah, so it's probably, it's not technically impressive at all, but I'd say it's, it's a major innovation in the LSP spec, like on the LSP side. Like I think it's desperately missing in the protocol itself. It's kind of sad that we had to invent this from scratch. And I'd love to see something like this get picked up uh, kind of more broadly. Um, and um, so this is why I'm super excited to see that there's um, someone who implemented support for the tree views in Emacs as well. So if you're an Emacs user, <laughs> I see some. It was, there's always one person in the audience like, no, there's more, three, four people. OK, cool. Um, so there you can see a very similar experience where you can navigate tree views, expand and collapse. Uh, and like the protocol itself is super simple. It's actually like most editors have some way to explore you know, a file tree. So if you turn that into an async operation, you just want to list out the members of a class, you can delegate that to a separate process, uh, metals, for example. So uh, I thought that this was super cool. And down the road, you know, this is, I'm just mind blown when I use IntelliJ and I run the tests. And I'm able to, you know, it shows me the tree view of like, this was the test suite, this test failed, this test ran for so long. If I press on that test case, it shows me the standard output for just an indiv individual test case. This is super helpful if you're just trying to, you know, debug why something went wrong. It's way more helpful than scrolling through, you know, mounts of console output. Um, and, and not everyone have the kind of, you know, dexterity to go into their terminal and figure out the 50 flags you need to run an individual test case, which changes from every test suite, no, testing framework to every other testing framework. So um, I think this is just an amazing you, you know, user experience that I'd, I'd love to see in the LSP world. Um, and, and hopefully we can implement it with test views, uh, tree views um, in metals. So really, I'm just a call to action. If you know anyone who's doing language servers or editor plugins, uh, we have on our website a spec, you, you know, very well specified data structures, what the, product, what the contract is between the server and the client. And it's very generic. It, it has nothing to do with Scala. So um, I, 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 I think I encourage everyone who are working in this space to kind of do these extensions, cause, but also share them and document them. And because and, uh, I think standards is really how we get, you know, move the, the industry forward. So this is the one I'm most excited about to share today, um, which is uh, worksheets. So um, worksheets in Metals got merged a week ago, and they are files with the .worksheet.sc file extension, and they evaluate on file save. So the whole idea is you just write a snippet of some bit of code, and whenever you save, it gets evaluated and uh, the evaluation will display right next to the code uh, as comments, but you can't edit these comments. They're uneditable. If you try to select the code, it won't select the, co it won't select the comments. And uh, I think this is such a great replacement for the REPL if you're doing, you know, just trying to learn um, some new API. And what's amazing, I think, is that the lower end, like if you have very small worksheets, it's able to render them in roughly 200 milliseconds. Uh, and it kind of, when you start working with it, and if you have 10 expressions and you're trying to see the, the, the relationship between different variables, you can just save. And I haven't had that experience with Scala ever before, where you can just save and you get that feedback right away. And you're, it's, it's almost like your thinking process is at the same speed as how you can kind of see it evaluated in the program. Um, and uh, so if you're working with very large data structures, um, you, 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 you parse a large data structure and then you have it in memory. Um, the worksheets are using a library from Howe, who was presenting earlier today, called pprint, which lazily kind of renders out very nicely line-wrapped data structures. Uh, so um, if you have something like here, 
as you can see, it's going to nicely align them so that, that it's, it's still understandable. Like, it's not just going to display everything in a big, long line, um, which I think is gorgeous. Um, and maybe as you didn't notice uh, from here as well, uh, the first line stream is, is an infinite list, but it's just lazily printed out just to the point where we can display it in the editor. So you can even work with infinite data structures and have them in your raffle, and it's not going to just run forever uh, hanging. Uh, I think that's cool. So um, this part is super exciting to me as well, is that you can have a worksheet that depends on code in your own library. So uh, you can just have in your own library, like a file, utility methods. You can auto-complete them, auto-import them in your worksheets. And what's amazing is you can go back into your main code file and change it. So uh, sorry. So here we go into the example.scala, and we, we bump up. Um, the, we change the method implementation. And when we switch the focus back to the worksheet, it has already picked up that compilation, and it, it updates the worksheets to the latest state of your project, uh, which is, I think, a phenomenal. Like, if you've been in the, if you work with the REPL before, you you often have to like escape the REPL, and then do console again, and then reevaluate all the expressions you've had. And here, it's really just switch a tab in your editor, and you don't have to even press save. Just the act of switching the focus will reevaluate the worksheet. So it's, it's super effortless. Um, and I'm really excited about this. And I think if you're a library author, it's just having that, being able to try out your API right away as you're iterating on it. You see how bad the API is. You start tweaking it. You say, oh, no, I want the worksheet to look like that. And I'm, yeah, I think it's, it's going to be, um, I'm really excited about it. So another cool thing with the worksheets is that, um, I haven't seen this in another tool, but uh, if, you, if you have a runtime error, it's actually going to report a diagnostic, like red squiggles. Uh, and if you hover over that error, the error message is actually going to be the full stack trace. So uh, what's maybe not obvious is that this is a runtime exception that's appearing as a position error message in your editor, uh, which is super cool. Uh, so it's like that runtime and compile time are just folded into a one experience. I, 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 when I got used to it, it's just super cool. And um, yeah, I, I was surprised when I even, I implemented, but I was still surprised when I ran it. I was like, I can't believe this. <laughs> uh, so this is a bit crazier, but if, you like, if, you, if you're trying to understand super hairy code, maybe there's some threads and low-level APIs, and you're like, oh, I really don't understand, uh, you know, you, you can actually still print line debug, and, and the standard output is going to be captured, and it'll be attached to the actual expression where that thing got printed. So here we, we do a new thread. Uh, we start the thread. It prints out start. Uh, it sleeps for 500. When you do join, it captures the stop output. And I haven't seen something that visualizes that experience in the same way in one view. Um, so, so this is pretty cool as well. Um, so this is called in metals. There's on the website a declaration protocol, but it's really nothing but just a single JSON RPC notification where metals just pushes to the editor saying these are the declarations you should display in the in the editor, um, which is done during that LSP communication. Uh, there's only one server implementation, uh, and there's only one client that supports it. But it's really something that I would love to see in LSP. Because just everything that I've shown you right now is something that is just not possible within LSP. You really have to do your own custom thing. And you know, imagine if that is available to all of these languages that are out there. That would be just incredible. So um, the last part is, is uh, but absolutely not the least, um, build servers. So, so Metals is, I think, a bit unusual compared to a lot of other language servers, is that it has a very close integration with the build server, which is Bloop. Um, um, and uh, so you remember the compilation view, where um, you would see that dynamic updates of what's being compiled in the background. So, so that is not happening in Metals. It's happening in a build server, which uh, is Bloop in this case. 
And uh, we have a website, Build Server Protocol, and there's an organization on GitHub, Build Server Protocol, that we, we collaborated together with JetBrains on. Uh, so you can also use BSP uh, to import projects in IntelliJ. And it's just been one of these projects that I'm, I'm super proud of, of having worked on, because uh, I think it really is solving a, a core part that exists in the whole ecosystem. Where it, what you, it's pretty much the same problem as the language server protocol, where you have a lot of build tools and a lot of language servers. And currently, you need to do like a custom integration with each of the build servers, uh, build tools for every language server, and you end up with like a large matrix. Um, so instead of with BSP, you can just have a contract. You do one implementation in, in IntelliJ, one implementation in VS Code, or, and, and then uh, you, you get support for all of the build tools. So this is something that I would really love to see gain sort of wider industry adoption as well. Um, um, and, and really, the, the, on, on the server side, I'm, the picture points to SPT, Gradle, Mill, and Maven. But none of those tools actually implement BSP. We're kind of lying. The, it's, it's Bloop, which is a build server, which this talk is not about, but it's, you should really check it out. Uh, has ways to understand all of those build tools. And, um, uh, and then we have one build server implementation for all of those. So there was a talk earlier today. Please check it out and check out Loop. So in conclusion, um, LSP is amazing. Don't get me wrong. It's just enabled us to ship so many features in such a short time. But it's really not enough if you're going to implement a full-blown IDE. Um, so I encourage people to do small LSP extensions. They really make a, you know, make a big difference in closing that gap. And please document them, spec them, advertise them, go to conferences, speak about it. Uh, so debug adapter protocol for running and testing code, I think, is really the way to go. Uh, Treeview protocol, I think it's working great for us. Uh, people have commented and said it, it's nice. It has support. For, it works in Emacs and LVS code. That's a good endorsement. A decoration protocol, uh, I hope that the demos that I showed you are appealing enough to, 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 for that to get adopted more widely. And finally, uh, yeah, just give medals a try. So thank you. I don't know if we have time for any questions. I, yeah, I think we have a couple minutes for a few questions. Anyone? I see a hands back there. There we go. Hello. That was a fantastic talk. Um, I wanted to say one thing, which is that the interactive uh, kind of worksheets that you showed um, was extremely exciting. I would say that to me, that's one of the really biggest benefits of uh, using Emacs and Emacs Lisp is being able to not only like, have your expressions interoperable, but have them constantly update, and then even be able to have a file with all of the results. So that's extremely exciting to see, especially in a language like Scala, which is much less di quote unquote dynamic. So thanks a lot for, for showing that. I'm available in the hallway track as well. So. Great. Great. Well, let's give a round of applause and thanks our speaker. Thank you, Olaf. Thank you.